want to tell you how much we love you, how much we worship and adore you. We praise you, God. May what we do bring honor and glory, honor and glory and praise to the King of kings, the Lord of lords, our mighty God. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, this is to coattail onto what my wife said about voting. And here's this. I was asking God, God, how do we pray? Because probably most of us have picked out a candidate and pray, I hope my candidate wins. And so the choice is difficult. But God put something else on my heart about how to pray. And that is this, that I want you to imagine and think about what you size in candidate. And there's plenty. But think about what you criticize. They lie, they cheat, they're immoral, they're this and that. And God put it on my heart to say, that's what you pray about. You pray that I will forgive them for those sins, but more importantly, that I will forgive you because as you are pointing your finger at that person for that sin, you can look back and there's three of them pointing at you. And that would be a great result as the result, I've often prayed, what kind of result do we want of this election? Do we want peace in the streets? Do we want rioting? What do we want? What we want is a revived church, is an awakened church, a church that loves Jesus, a church that proclaims him, and the way we do that is we, we confess our sins. God, I'm sure there's times when I have lied. I ask you to forgive me for that. I'm sure there are times when I have either knowingly or unknowingly cheated someone. And I'm sorry for that. I repent. So that's what, we, that's what I want you to pray as you're praying. Pray yes for, the, for a godly outcome for this election. But basically, pray that you, you individually, will get right with God. And you might say, but pastor, I come to church, I, I work, worship church, I worship God in church. And I say, I know, that's perfect, that's wonderful. But now we wanna make sure that we are moving on in a deeper way with God. And I, I don't have to be involved, I don't, don't go around saying, you sin this, you do that. God will prompt you. Because all you do is look at the candidate and what makes you irate about that candidate is probably a sin that you are dealing with. And so you ask the Lord to forgive you. And so that when the results of the election will be Christians on fire, Christians repented, re Christians blessed. And wouldn't that be a good result? So think about that. I thought that was an insight that God gave me for my way to pray, and I thought I should share it with you. Did I make myself clear? Okay, all right. Now, what do I wanna to share today? I have a subject that is that has been taught many times here in this church, but I just wanna review it again. Curses to blessings, from curses to blessings. And certainly that's what, that's what we want in our life, right? Be free? Okay, from curses to blessings. Now, can anybody identify this little phrase here? Double, double, toil and trouble. Fire burn and cauldron bubble. Where does that come from? What's that? Somebody is a scholar here. It's a quote from Macbeth in Shakespeare. And what it is, it's the scene from Macbeth with three old hags crackling around the boiling cauldron is what we often conjure up when we think of curses. But these malevolent utterances of evil seemingly do in certain circumstances affect some people. 
However, the Bible says that God made us to sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, far above all principalities and power and might and dominion in this world. As long as we are in Christ, we are free from the effects of these kinds of curses. Isn't that a wonderful assurance? He's much better. Now, how do you know if you have any curses in your life? How do you know that, if you have any curses in your life? Well, these are so a list of some things that could be either inherited family line or also put upon you by people who don't like you. Now, whether you like it or not, and it's a hard point to get a hold of, there are probably some people who don't like you. Just probably a long shot, maybe one. <laughs> so we need to protect ourselves spiritually. Now here are some lists. Here's a list of some things that can be curses in our lives. And by curses, I mean they, they just hold us back. We just fall into that same thought pattern and just hold us back. Problem conceiving, depression, tumors, work problems, persecution, fever, tuberculosis, inflammation, fear, and fear is a big one, lack of answered prayer, insanity, confusion, blindness, uh, sores that will not heal, marital problems, infidelity, financial problems, accidents, violence. Ever have, sometimes you ever feel like there's a curse on you? Because whatever you do falls apart. Just doesn't, it just doesn't work. And so that could be as a result of a curse. And that could be a curse. Of, an example would be like growing up and your father or mother sees you messing up in the sandbox and say to you, can't you do anything right? You're a disaster. Are you going to be a failure? And you take that into your spirit, into your soul, and it becomes a curse. And then there's accidents, violence, robbery, oppressive government, discrimination, poverty, destruction, business failures, depravity. Sickness and death are a result of the fall of man and the consequent curse that was imposed upon creation. But yet, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. Galatians 3.13. Now, the reason I'm doing this is because whether you like it or not, we are totally enveloped and, and, and involved in this Halloween holiday. And, you know, we can put ourselves at distance, but no matter where we go, it's all propagated propaganda. Do this, do that. It's become as big a holiday as Thanksgiving. It's amazing. But I want you to look at the history of it for a minute. Many of you know this, some of you don't. Because we as Christians need to how to deal with it and deal with it spiritually and deal with it with the power of the blood of Jesus Christ. The power of Jesus' name. It's not just a, a, a little side fun thing. No, it's interesting to me. They designed all kinds of costumes for people to wear. But none of them, they're all ugly. They all look scary and afraid. But you know, they can't outdo the one who made you. You're pretty. You're pretty. You are beautiful. You're the handiwork of God Almighty. You are marvelous, wonderful. There's never been a creature that they came up with a costume that's prettier than you. You're pretty. You're beautiful. And to me, that shows that the roots of this evil is not godly, but anti-God. Now, here's the history of Halloween. Halloween means Holy Eve. The eve of the night before the holy day. So in history, at around the 15, 1600s. The real holiday was November 1st. 
November 1st was All Saints Day when the churches would come together and they would praise God for their great founding fathers and for the great characters in the Bible, for those leading men and women in Scripture. And so they'd have a great day of praise. Well, how did it get twisted? Here's what happened. People began to say, you know, we're dealing with a spiritual thing here, and we want the spirits to be the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit to have freedom. But we know that our life all last year before this was not led by the spirit, was led by the evil spirits. So we need to chase the evil spirits out of here. So they began to have parades all through the cities to, 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 to deliver or break the curses of the bad one, of the evil spirits. And so they thought, well, the best way to scare the evil spirits is to put on a scary costume. So they started to put on scary, scary costumes. I'll get that. And, and just, they thought, that would do it. And so gradually, instead of the emphasis being on November 1st, All Saints Day, it shifted back to the Eve, Halloween, Holy Eve, to a time in which they're supposed to be chasing out demons. But they're inviting them, is really what's happening. They're inviting them to come. So what we need to do is say, okay, you guys out there, you're going to do it, do it. But you don't do it in my house. No, we want to have a holy time. You want to have a holy worship time. And it would be amazing if you could get a hold of, get online or Google some of these Old Testament saints and some of these old church heroes around Martin Luther and around that time. And on, the, on, the, on Monday, on the 1st, that has to be Monday now. No, no, on, what, what's the 1st? Tuesday. Okay, that's the time we should celebrate it on Tuesday. But celebrate Holy Day full of praises. Wouldn't that be great? Nobody's responding. I'm taking your toys away. I'm sorry. No, <laughs> no, no. Okay, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 6, 7, and 8. Ephesians 2, 6, 7, and 8. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming age he might show that incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. God has a purpose. He's raised us up out of that muck and mire. Now, how do you handle curses? You ever look in the mirror sometime and say, oh, no, that gesture, that motion, that's just like my father. Or did you have an argument with your wife and say, you're just like your mother? Or the children saying, Mommy, why do you do that? You remind me of Grandma. But those those are, could be genetic inherited curses that come to our family line. But then there's also present day what I call soul curses. Now, I, I believe in soul power. There's a lot of power in soul power. And probably what you think of that is wishful thinking. You see a person doing something, and you say, I wish they wouldn't do that, because that offends me. I wish I want them to do it this way. And you just exhort your spirit upon them, push your, your will upon them, and you sort of manipulate them to try to get them to behave the way you want them to behave. That's soul power. Our soul is our mind, our will, and our emotions. What, what causes that mind, will, and emotion to come together, to focus? And then there's soul ties. Soul ties comes from being intimate with someone or ones. And then there's soul blessings. So you have soul power, soul ties, and then soul blessings. Soul blessings means that you trust someone so much 
that you just open yourself up and are totally honest, you totally trust them, and then you, re then you bless them. You give them positive blessing. You say, God, I pray for, and that's what prayer is. We're praying for someone to be blessed. Now, let's look at Romans chapter 8, verses 1 and 2. There's two things mentioned in this. Therefore, there is now no condemnation unto those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. There's two laws there, the law of the Spirit and the law of sin and death. Hallelujah, the law of sin and death is broken. There's no more condemnation. That is broken by the precious shed blood of Jesus Christ. The law, not of the law of the life in the Spirit, God gives us life in the spirit when the curses are broken. Now, I want to look into Deuteronomy chapter 28 and just read a whole lit litany of a list of praises and of ways God wants to bless, God wanted to bless the Israelites, the way he wanted to bless them and in different ways, and it go carries on to us. Okay. If you'll fully, fully obey the Lord your God and carefully follow all his commands I give you today, the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations on earth. All these blessings will come on you and accompany you if you obey the Lord your God. You will be blessed in the city, blessed in the country. The fruit of your womb will be blessed the crops of your land and the young of your livestock, the calves of all your herds and the lambs of your, your flocks, your basket and your kneading through dough, tr trough, oh, tr okay, <laughs> kneading trough will be blessed, blessed. Uh, you will be blessed when you come in and bless when you go out. The Lord will grant you, will grant that the enemies who rise up against you will be defeated before you. They will come at you from one direction but flee from you in several, in seven. The Lord will send a blessing on your barns, on everything you, everything you put your hand to. The Lord your God will bless you in the land he has given you. That's it, right? Okay. See all those promises? Now, that's the key. It's promises in the Old Testament. Now, there's interesting promises in the New Testament. In Mark chapter 10, 29 and 30. Okay. Truly, I tell you, Jesus replied, no one who has left home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for me and the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age. Homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and fields along with persecution and in the age to come, eternal life. Isn't that a great promise? A hundred times. He promises he will give us a hundred times that blessing. Now, there's one other New Testament passage I want to read before we pray a prayer to break any curses over our lives. Matthew 16, 19. Matthew 16. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Okay, that's the key. How do you bind, how do you loose here on earth? What you do, that's what our prayers are. When we pray and intercede, 
we bind the evil one. We say that. We say, Lord Jesus, you bind, you deliver, you break the bondage, you, you, t you set us free. Lord Jesus, please, you do it, Lord. And then if it's bound up in heaven, if Jesus agrees and binds it, then it's bound down here on earth. If it's loose here in, up in heaven to be free, then it's loose, free down here. So that's, that's the power in prayer. Now, what I'd like to do is to pray a prayer asking Jesus to break some of these curses that you might have in your life. Okay? That's what I want to do. Because I want you to be free. I want you to be free. And I want you to know that there's power in words. Have you ever wished once you said a sentence that would be like a fishing line, you could reel it back in and say, I'm sorry I ever said that. But there's words, can't, and words, some, sometimes when you speak words out there, they go boom, they hit like a fiery dart. And the person just goes, oh, and you can see, oh no, I should have never said that. Why did I say that? So there's power in words. Now here's another illustration of power in words. Did you know that in the Bible, particularly in Genesis, there's a whole description of creation? And in that, all of that scripture, God never created. There's no account where God, where it says God took his hand and he, and he shaped and he made, and that was a pheasant. And he shaped and he made, and that was a pumpkin. And he took his hands and he shaped and he made, and that was a candle. There's never a thing like that. You know how God did it? Spoke it. Just spoke it. Just with his words. God said, let there be light. Boom, there was light. Let there be day, there was day. Let there be animals, there were animals. He just said it. God has that power in his word. And Jesus is called the word. In the beginning was the word. And the word was God. And the word was with God. So God has that power in his word. Now, what we need to do is learn how to use that too. Because as we speak words of freedom and words of healing and words of deliverance, we'll have it. Now, I'm not trying to say you can never report something bad and say, oh, don't speak it, you'll get it. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is that after you've described an incident, let's say, Somebody has a cold. Say, so, okay, that person over there, they have a bad cold. Okay, that's the start. You start by, that's, that's an actual description that they have a bad cold. That's all right. But then you begin to say, well, let's pray. Let's pray. I can just see that person healthy. God's able to heal that person, to take that cold away, to give that person a, a new life and health and strength. So there's power in words. If we continue to say, this is no good, you're no good, you're going to fail, you're going to do this, you're going to do that, that's probably what will happen. But you need to take, you can accurately describe it and say, this person's struggling and is really down. But let's pray. Let's pray that God will lift them up and set them free. So what I'd like to do before I conclude, before I give the second half of the sermon, is to pray a group prayer to break us free from the curses that are in our life. And I'm not saying people have, all people have these curses, but these are some that just stand out in my mind. And what I say is, I'll pray, Lord Jesus, break the curse of this. Lord Jesus, break the curse of this. Lord Jesus, break the curse of this. There's about five or six terms. There's probably a lot more. But, and then you have to have the faith to believe that this, that word prayed will matter. Okay? You with me? You waking up? Okay. All right. Just repeat after me. Lord Jesus, I break the curse of sickness. I ask you to break the curse of poverty. I ask you to break the curse of I the curse of stealing. 
to curse of wayward children. to take away fear and Lord I ask you to take away depression Lord I believe you're God of all things I pray for freedom now Holy Spirit move in Jesus name Amen Okay, that was all to break the curses. Now, the good stuff, the blessings. The blessing. Have you, do you have faith to believe that you can bless somebody? That you can bless them? And I think that's, that well, I do. And I, have, I have pro that, pray that you do. And I encourage you that almost every person you meet either shake their hand or greet them and while you're shaking their hand. Say it as you mean it. God bless you. That means God will add an extra measure of his mercy, of his grace, of his strength. God bless you. Extra measure. It's, you know, I work part-time parking cars and I have a point. That every time I come in, I work on the shift, I shake everybody's hand and say, God bless you. Everybody. God bless you. And when I leave, I get on the radio and I broadcast. I say, hey, team, I'm leaving. God bless you. Have a good night. And, and uh, they, they usually respond 10-4 or something like that. So, but the other day, I was helping a guy, and I had him in, my, in a pickup truck, and we were going to find a car. And he's, he's a young kid, and he says, uh, he says, I live in Windsor Locks. I said, oh, great, where do you live? He said, I live on Spring Street. I said, oh, where on Spring Street? He said, down by Jubilee Lane. I said, that's not far from my church. He said, what church? I said, Living Waters Church. I'm the pastor there. <laughs> and he swore. <laughs> he says, oh, blank, I can't believe this. I got the reverend with me. <laughs> and then he says, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. That just slipped out. He said, you're, you're kidding me that you're the minister of that church? I said, that's right. He says, you can't be. <laughs> I said, yeah, I am. <laughs> and so, but, he, but no longer that, two sentences later, he says, pray for me. My dad's a drug addict. And he said, if I don't work, we, we are kicked out of our house. So here's this young kid working because his dad is a drug addict. So I prayed for him while I was still driving. And so that's, that's what I mean. Bless people. They need to be blessed. You need to be blessed. In your home, bless people. Bless them. Okay, get blessings. Get financial blessings, fame, cars. Honor. Now, here's the one that is most challenging to me, and I love it, that God has promised that children are a blessing. God has promised that children are a blessing. I do I hear some giggles here. <laughs> is that a reflection of doubt? You know, the lady who, who she and her husband wrote this book describes raising her three teenage boys. She said, with three teenage boys, she said, this is what life was like. She said, just imagine, Tom, imagine, you get into a canoe and you have your whole family in the canoe and you are heading toward Niagara Falls <laughs> and you're trying with all your might not to go over Niagara Falls. And this lady said, that's what it's like to raise three teenage boys. Yeah. <laughs> she said another one. She said, you know, I used to fear death, not after raising my boys. That's nothing. <laughs> raising children. That's why I wanted to focus on blessing, the blessing of children. Now, that's t it takes faith. It takes faith to believe that. But most of the time when we pray on Wednesday nights, that subject always comes up. 
Pray for our children, our grandchildren, great-grandchildren, for protection, for blessing. And I believe it. And I'm going to see great children because the devil has cursed our kids. He has cursed them with all kinds of things. And our children are, are, are sort of like going to battle in a bathing suit rather than going to battle with the whole armor of God on. They need that armor. They need that. Okay, but first of all, it takes faith. So, let's, okay, 1 John 5, 4 and 5. Did I sneak up on you? I'm sorry. Okay, for everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. Who is that? Who is it that overcomes the world? Only the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. This is the truth. This is the truth that we need to hear. Believe, believe, believe. Repent, believe. Repent, believe. Repent and believe. That Have that type of faith that God will do it. Now, just in case you think I'm leading you astray, let's look to Psalm 127, verses 3, 4, and 5. Psalm 127, verses 3, 4, and 5. There it is. It's the word of God. Believe it, okay? Children are a heritage from the Lord, offsprings of reward from him. Like arrows in the hands of a warrior are children born in one's youth. Blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them. They will not be put to shame when they contend with their opponents in court. Lots of children. Now, I don't expect nine months from now we're going to have a lot of births. <laughs> that would be equal to Mary the Virgin's birth. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but children are a blessing. I just, I just want to underscore that. Children are a blessing, okay? Okay. Now, just in case you're having difficulties with this, children are a blessing. Let's look at Malachi, the last verses of the Old Testament. Malachi 4, 5, and 6. We're going to get some help on this. See, I will send the prophet Elijah to to you before that great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. He will turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the hearts of the children to their parents, or else I will come and strike the land with total destruction. God's going to help us. God's going to help us. The families are at war today even if there is a father there, that's usually war. And our families are being scattered apart. The hurtful things are said. Hearts are broken. Bad things are, even curses are said upon each other. God is going to turn the hearts of the children and turn the hearts of the parents to their children. Psalm 23, 5 and 6. Thou preparest the table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Surely goodness and mercy. Goodness and mercy. Goodness and mercy. God has promised that things will come into our life. Good things will come into our life. Blessings will come into our life. He's promised that. When we deal with the curses, break the curses, and enter into the blessings, God will bless. It will happen. God will turn it around. I believe it. Do you? Okay, that was, I, I'm going to go home. No. We have to have a little stronger than that, okay? I believe it. Do you? Okay, good. Because it's the word of God. All right? What I want to do is close with a prayer of blessing. And I want you, 
if you're, stand, if you're sitting next to someone that you aren't fighting with, that you're close to, yeah, I want you to join hands in agreement, okay? And if you're fighting with them, make up right now, you know, okay? Okay, join hands. I'm going to pray, Lord, bless me in. Lord, bless me in this. Lord, bless me in this, okay? And believe it. Believe, and blessing means God's adding. God's adding his presence. He's adding his holiness. He's adding his grace. He's adding his mercy. He's adding his abundance. God is adding when you have the blessing. The devil comes to take away. He's a liar and a deceiver. But now we're praying for added blessing. Okay. Lord Jesus, repeat after me. Lord Jesus, in your name, we claim blessings. Claim the blessing of grace and love. We pray you'll bless us as we go in and as we go out. Pray that you'll bless our families. Give us a destiny and a hope. Pray that you'll bless us in our work and finances. Bless us in saving for the future. Bless us for food and clothing in the future. Bless us for shelter at homes. And bless us with an extra portion of your Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, give us freedom. Give us freedom. In the name of Jesus, I receive this blessing. Amen. Do you believe it? Blessings, blessing each other, blessing each other. No cursing. Okay.